Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about recovery support and the necessary coordination, collaboration, and recovery management of services. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. Keith Humphreys, Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Stanford School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry, Stanford, California. Beverly Haberly, Project Director, Pennsylvania Recovery Organization, Achieving Community Together, Southeast Pennsylvania. Joe Powell, Executive Director, Association of Persons Affected by Addiction, Dallas, Texas. Dr. Thomasina Borkman, Professor of Sociology, Emerita, George Mason University, Fairfax, Virginia. Keith, let's start out by letting the audience know uh, what is the need for treatment in terms of substance use and mental disorders in this country? A lot of people aren't aware of how prevalent these conditions are, um, but uh, it, amazingly there are 45 million American adults who meet the criteria for a mental health problem and 23 million who meet it for uh, substance use, alcohol or drugs, and uh, most of those who also smoke. And the overlap between those groups is about 10 million people who, who struggle with both those problems. So that means at any given time, one in four people in this country could conceivably benefit from treatment for a mental health or a substance use disorder. And actually, we're using the term now behavioral health. You right. want to explain a little bit what behavioral yeah. health encompasses? Behavioral health is a bridging term, a way, I mean, what's happening around the country is there's much more desire to integrate services, integrate thinking about these uh, different types of disorders. And behavioral health is a sort of a way we describe them as a whole because there are certain things that are quite similar about, uh, about them having a chronic course, having a, a part that's about our own behavior, environment, things of that sort. So that's the phrase that's being used much more um, at the federal level and also around the country. Mm -hmm. And Bev, I suspect that many of these folks have co-occurring conditions. You want to help us understand a little bit what co-occurring conditions Absolutely. are all about? You know, many of, of uh, people will have two separate conditions occurring at the same time. So they may have um, depression along with a substance use disorder. Um, and so parallel um, services need to occur in order for them to be able to sustain long-term recovery. And Joe, speaking of co-occurring issues, um, how many people are actually treated, you know, for co-occurring and for uh, substance use and for mental illnesses? Well, um that's a good question, Yvette. Um, I mean, there are many, of course, that are millions, of course, of people that are getting treated for both co-occurring disorders, um, and that is uh, all over the country. I think that in treatment, um, they have been parallel, um, and they have been separated. So now is the time for treatment to happen for both. Yes. Does everyone, uh, Thomasina, that wants to get treatment, do they get, are they able to find it? Is there enough treatment around the country if, if all these millions of people wanted to be uh, uh, treated for their condition? I mean, there certainly is, is a lot of self-help groups uh, that are open and they're almost cost-free. Um, I think the question also is, of all the millions of people, though, many of them are not ready for treatment. So it, it's just because they need treatment doesn't mean that they're ready and willing to go to treatment. So I think that's a really big issue for both mental illness and the substance part, use. Part, I think an important part of that, uh, Tom C, is that sometimes the quality of the services hasn't been there. So sometimes people would like to seek help. But for example, the you know, treatment program is only open when they're at work, or there's no parking, right. there's no child care. And so part of what you know, our responsibility is, is to make those services uh, more attractive and more accessible right. to the population. Because it, you know, as you know, only about one in 10 people with an addiction will get right. treatment each year, and, and only about one in three with a, a, a mental health problem get treatment right. each year. Yeah. And, just, and just to add to that, uh, you were saying it was 45 million people, of course, that was suffering from substance use. And the same thing, it seems like that, that, that it's 19.7 is what I heard um, the statistic is as far as people with a co-occurring. So it's almost half of the folks that have a co-occurring disorder. We're both at the same time, mental illness and substance yeah. use. 
I think the other thing is that there are so many different levels of care and types of services that people need that it's so important to make sure that someone is accessing the level and the, the type of service or the pathway to recovery mm -hmm. um, that one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. So the question is, you know, is there enough of the various types of services available? Um, because you're right, everybody can't go, you know, during the day when they need to work or they need to do other right. things. But there are there needs to be a whole menu of kinds of ways for people to get the services that they need. Mm -hmm. And Joe, you had you yourself are in recovery and and are one of our uh, pride and joy in terms of individuals <laughs> who go around the country talking about your recovery. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell the audience, really, in terms of your own situation, how you came? Uh, into recovery and, and 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 what was your pathway? Right. Well, thanks for asking, Yvette. Yeah, definitely, I'm uh, in long-term recovery, and of course, it's only because of long-term recovery I'm able to be a father today and a, and a husband and a person, and also that uh, is the executive director for the Association of Persons Affected by Addiction. Um, for years, of course, I was 36 years old when I first uh, went into uh, of the rooms of, of a place that uh, they reached out for me. Um, and it was a 12-step program that actually helped me and welcomed me. Um, but before that, I mean, I had uh, uh, struggled severely with both uh, addiction, uh, alcoholism, and substance use. And also having a family. Uh, out of seven brothers and one sister, five have serious mental illness. Mm -hmm. And all eight of us struggled with addiction and alcoholism. Uh, and now my mother didn't drink, but only my dad did. But for my recovery, of course, that once I got in and it just so happened that that one person that, uh, that reached out to and, and helped me uh, through these last 23 years uh, has or has been with me uh, for a while to help me in my recovery. Uh, my recovery has taken off with new meaning and, 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 uh, and quality of life to where, yeah, I can do what I do today. It's only because of my long-term recovery. But I'm also able to, to give back uh, for me uh, all that I have been given freely. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about uh, Samson being able to be at even as part of this leadership as far as recovery and moving the recovery throughout the community. Uh, today, of course, being executive director for APA, uh, Association of Persons Affected by Addiction, which is a recovery organization, we are actually able to not only locally but also with this working with the state and the federal to actually move as, as part of being part of the recovery movement. But it's only because of my personal recovery where it all started. And you're also working with some of the folks in in the recovery movement in the uh, mental health community. Talk a little bit about that. Very important, and and you know I didn't see this at first, of course, uh, um, and also being um, a licensed chemical dependency counselor. To, to do the work on myself mm -hmm. as well as to see about the co-occurring mental, mental illness part and the mental health part of my own family. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you know, the way it worked in, in my recovery is that uh, being a counselor and working with people with co-occurring and also looking at my own family, now I'm at the level to where we are, uh, we're doing work with the managed care company. We're able to do also as far as the recovery-oriented system of care to integrate both, both sides of the system, the mental health side and the addiction. So not only uh, do I work with the addiction side, but also with NAMI, Mental Health Association, et cetera. And we'll be talking a little bit more about the systems uh, uh, framework uh, in, in some of the other panels. But Tomasina, I want to get back to the whole issue of, of really what are the costs to society for individuals that need treatment and, and don't get the help? I mean, it's huge. Uh, a large part of our homeless population either have mental illness or substance abuse or both, a huge part. Um, and that is a very tragic thing. Their health problems are greater. Um, their, the financial costs are greater. Uh, the health problems, uh, particularly like the people with co-occurring disorders, they live a shorter length of time. They have more uh, other kinds of chronic d conditions. Okay. Um, so on and on. The family, I, I mean, we could go on and on about the family consequences, the broken families that, that, that can be healed together by recovery. Right. And Keith, there's also some workplace issues, tremendous workplace oh, issues, absolutely. correct? Absolutely. I mean, uh, it's one of the most common reasons for absenteeism on the job is, is substance use or mental health problems, injuries on the job, accidents on the job, workplace violence. I mean, these problems are sown through every, every part of American life. And that, that's the really daunting 
uh, aspect of this problem. But the, the upside is recovery. I mean, just as, as Joe was saying so well, you look at, at, at how much he's giving back, is because addiction is so destructive by definition, then recovery is a chance for us to, you know, get double benefits and repair that, that damage and, and benefit the entire society, not just the person with the problem. And Bev, um, in terms of, of that whole issue, um, uh, in, in the workplace in particular, I know that, that there are um, policies in place that mm -hmm. companies can adopt, right. correct? Yes, drug-free workplace policies, um, employee assistance programs where people can um, access help at the earliest possible moment so that they're then supported, um, back, integrated back into the workplace. Yeah, I also wanted to mention the impact on the criminal justice system, though. And I think what's so exciting is that when people really um, have opportunities to access recovery and move into long-term recovery, you know, their involvement with the criminal justice system just goes down, you know, so much. And um, people who haven't had a way out now have a pathway to be able to restore their life and l move away from their, their life of being involved in the criminal justice system. And I'm glad you talked about pathways because when we come back, we're going to be talking about the whole the changes in the healthcare system and how they're going to affect substance use disorder and mental health services. We'll be right back. Well, the Recovery Support Initiative is really a recognition that uh, a vast uh, majority of Americans have some experience of mental illness or addiction, either themselves or in their families. And we tend to think of this as a quiet or hidden uh, problem, and it's really not. Uh, people are seeking help through their primary care physicians, they're seeking help through specialty organizations, and they're seeking help through mutual aid uh, uh, approaches. So when we think about who's in recovery or who or what does that mean, uh, we really have to go back to uh, it has to do with people with mental health and substance use problems who have identified themselves as needing that uh, help to, to move uh, into recovery, and it's a very personal path. SAMHSA is uh, one of our priorities is uh, recovery, and so our goal is to promote recovery through mobilizing all of the uh, relevant agencies to involve the consumer and uh, people in recovery in that effort to make sure families are uh, educated and that treatment services are available and that uh, we are working with child welfare, criminal justice, uh, as, as well as primary care so that people have access to services. We want uh, a recovery-oriented environment and that also includes housing, employment, uh, as well as the health care that I mentioned. It's very important to connect recovery and recovery support services to the dimensions of a person's life, which would include a home, having a purpose, living in a community, and in fact having relationships and something to occupy them in a normal, meaningful way. So recovery and recovery support services is a construct that SAMHSA proposes and uses in order to think about the individual living in a community with the appropriate kinds of supports and services that they need in order to make their life a quality one. They tell me I was there, but I don't remember. I don't know where I really was. I do not know what I had for breakfast. I do not know who won the game. I don't recognize this man. If you or someone you know is struggling with a drug or alcohol problem, there is a solution. Recovery. Call 1-800-662-HELP for information and for hope. Through treatment, my life's a whole lot brighter now. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. cool thing is that I'm at the level now of, uh, of the recovery movement that, uh, that I'm at, that at the federal level with SAMHSA and the White House, you know what I mean, and seeing how the top, how really still today, what we say that stuff rolls downhill, you know. So the cool thing is that with 13 years ago when, when CSAT and Dr. Clark said, you know, hey, we're going to do a peer-to-peer -peer recovery community support, and then I was part of that in 97, 98. 
in, th in 13 years later where we are today. So we've come a long way from 13 years ago of just advocating for recovery, prevention, and treatment. But I think that, uh, again, five years from now, we're going to come a long way because now everybody's on board. I think this year is like a really a turning point, a historical point, because we got not only the federal, but we also have the state. I'm involved at the state level and the local level, and everybody's doing the same work right now. Transformation, behavioral health, leadership, integration, and definitely uh, recovery community supports. Keith, let's talk a little bit before we get into the healthcare dialogue. Let's talk about how has recovery evolved throughout the years? Uh, it, there's been a very positive change uh, in the United States, which is, I, I'll just give a, a personal story. Early in my career, when I would give a talk about Alcoholics Anonymous, I would get angry emails from people saying, well, that's a bad organization. I got better in treatment. And then I give a talk about methadone, and then I get letters people saying, oh, methadone's terrible, you, you, know, you should tell people to do this and that way. It was like a bunch of little battling sex. And what's changed that's really exciting is that there's this uh, collective sense of we need to honor all pathways to recovery. And I think CSAT actually deserves a lot of credit for that with the National Summit on mm -hmm. Recovery. When people stood up there with people who had recovered you know, the wrong way and said, this is not my pathway, but I honor and accept that, that's when the recovery movement started to become a force because, you know, if you, if you don't divide yourself, then you have the ability to influence lots of other people. And that's very important because this is a health problem. And nobody ever says about cancer, you know, oh, you got better on tamoxifen instead of chemotherapy, how sad. They say, it's great, you know, you've recovered from cancer. And that's what we should say, everybody who recovers from these disorders, we should, you know, hug them, celebrate them, be very, very happy. And we do during yeah. recovery month. Right. That's right, right. yeah. Uh, may I say something yes. about the origin of recovery? Uh, the origin really is from Alcoholics Anonymous, the term. They use the term recovery. And I think it's really important, as we're going to talk later, about recovery being self-directed, that it came out of a self-help mutual aid movement. It did not start with professionals. And that is a real, the kind of the key pin of recovery is, I think, due to the historical basis in the 12-step in the movement. Thank you. And Bev, you know, uh, you were at the meeting in 2005, I believe, when we first gathered all the folks in recovery. I was there as well. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what was magic about that? Um, I think, as Keith said, the fact that people were all there talking about, you know, the different ways that, and, um, that they were able to access recovery, but also um, kind of in one room having the opportunity just to talk about it. I think that there has not been that opportunity to bring people from all different sectors of the, of the community together to really talk about recovery and try to define recovery and recovery principles and, you know, what are the values and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, maybe a leveling of the playing field mm -hmm. to be able to honor all of those different um, perceptions and, and ideas. And I also, I think that what Keith said about um, the recognition and celebration, I think many of us for many years hid our recovery. And I think the opportunity to be able to talk about it is really a blessing for many people because not only does it provide hope, it also is healing. It's not something to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And Joe, talk to us a little bit about those principles of yeah. full recovery. Great, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it's so interesting how the principles have came a long way. I mean, going back to like what you were saying, Thomasine, as far as Alcoholics Anonymous, but even today, uh, when we talk about pathways to recovery, that's one of the principles that we honor all pathways to recovery. And to see how SAMHSA really has taken the lead, I mean, of course, I go back 13 years ago to the first peer-to-peer -peer recovery community support program, where we had to put pathways, and we honored all roads to recovery, and we was creative and gave people that choice. But also honoring the many roads to recovery, um, of course, and then 
having a hope. Hope is another one, a recovery, a recovery principle of hope. Um, and installation, self-determination, person-centered uh, recovery is, is definitely has to be for a person of choice. Um, and also uh, moving toward the, how the community flourishes when, when recovery is also acknowledged and, and welcome. So uh, there's many uh, principles and that, that the cool thing is is that the Fed SAMHSA now has actually initiated principles of recovery in all of the, in all of their strategies now, uh, which, which which is the lead for all of the states and also for the community. Well, certainly because, I mean, the, we have had subsequent meetings to the 2005, and really it's, it's been a process. It's a, a very dynamic process of the agency taking from the field what the elements of the best practices are and what the need is and attempting to incorporate that into the programs. I think one of the things that's so important is really validating that there is not just one way. And for many of the people we see, um, they have been traditional treatment failures or traditional 12-step failures. And just to understand, or it, they felt that way, just to understand that there may be are other options or other things is so empowering for them that it really does reinforce that hope and gets them back on track. And then, you know, it's always surprising to me, many times they will then put a collection of things together that many times include what we would have thought of as traditional. Um, but, you know, they've had to kind of come a different path and come around to it. Mm -hmm. And Keith, how important is it that the Office of National Drug Control Policy now has an office on recovery issues? I think that is, oh, I have to say personally, one of the things I'm most proud of, of, the, of the, the time I was there and very grateful to, uh, you know, Director Kurlikowski for, for seeing the value of that. And again, just to tell a personal anecdote, I, I, when I would tell uh, friends of mine who were in recovery, they would often choke up. Uh, just the thought, you know, they, they felt like at last we've made it. There's an office in the White House that's focused on mm -hmm. us. And, and so just that office existence, I think, is very important to just remove the shame and, and, and the, you know, and, and help, I hope, roll back the discrimination that recovering people often, often encounter. And uh, the other thing to add to it is that it's, it's good to have the office, but it has to be very active. And so it's been very important that, you know, the director and the deputy director have been out at the recovery marches, have involved recovering people in the development of drug policy, listening sessions, um, uh, participation, because the, there's so much wisdom among people who've experienced this problem about how to help people. And we haven't tapped that. I think recovering people are like this oil shale I hear about. They're this, you know, that everyone's trying to figure out how to get, you know, the, uh, you know natural gas out of. And is that they're this massive source of energy. And if we could just figure out how to tap it, we would have enormous benefits for all of us. And so I think that's part of it. Thank you. Thomasina, you wanted to add something a little while ago. I think what is really critical about recovery is that it's self-directed. And instead of being professionally directed, it is self-directed, which makes the idea of many pathways of recovery even more important, right? And then the need for people to get information about the pathways and try and find out what will work for them. If I can just add on to that, um, giving people the opportunity to develop their own recovery plan as opposed to a treatment plan that has been given to them, we see just such a difference. It becomes their plan. And as it's their plan, there are opportunities for them to then really own and manage their own recovery, which is a very different kind of thing that has transpired over the years. And one of the things that we want to make sure that we do initiate is culture, though. And that's one of the recovery right, principles, is that culture must be on it also. Uh, the one thing that SAMHSA initiated uh, last year that I was excited about to being a part of is the dialogue between uh, consumers and peers in recovery on the addiction side. Mm -hmm. And we came and together. And consumers from the mental health, you right. mean? Yeah, consumers right. from the mental health and peers right. from the addiction yes. side. Yes. Right. Yes. And what we did, though, was we came up with commonalities right. that we both had. We also yeah. came up with differences, and we came up with a different definition of recovery that fits for both, which was that it's a process of change through health and wellness and also the communities of your choice. So that choice of what culture that I have, because Latinos, Asians, African Americans, right. and Native Americans, right. I mean, there's many different roads and paths to recovery. Right. Absolutely. And we've talked about a lot of the elements of recovery and the characteristics. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how those are going to fit into the new health care reform. We'll be right back.
Where's Mom? Did she forget me? I wonder what happened to her. What if I get left here? Drugs and alcohol may make you forget your problems for a moment, but that's not all you forget. My mother worked hard to be in recovery, and I love her for that. For drug and alcohol treatment for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The mission of the New START program is to uh, provide treatment opportunities for incarcerated males in the Orange County jail system. The program is designed to treat them while they're in custody and continue their treatment into the community at whatever level of care it is that they need for at least one year post-custody. Phoenix House provides that treatment. They provide continuing care, a group counseling. They provide fellowship, basically an all-encompassing kind of program from beginning to end, which really enables a person a really, really good shot at making it. What makes this project unique from other projects in Southern California is it's an in-custody program, but there's a continuum of care once someone is released from custody. And there's a team that works with these individuals when they're in custody and then follows up outside. It also includes family members. Um, and so that's the a very important piece of this. Once they begin to realize there is a possibility that they can learn to manage their recovery, and that they're better off staying in treatment, they begin to really engage. If an individual voluntarily seeks treatment, they're right from the beginning, they're more invested in it. They already recognize that they have a problem. The Phoenix House program was a life-changing program for myself. It totally changed my behaviors and helped me to appreciate the person that I was and helped me to really enjoy, like myself better. Going through there was one of the most single influential events of my entire life. It was an opportunity that presented itself at a time when I was ready to change my life. It provided me with the tools, the social support, in order to move forward in a more positive way with my life. Everything that I have, I really do believe to the bottom of my soul, is because I was accepted into this program. Somebody knew that I was going to need this before I knew I was going to need it and had it set up and it was in place. And when I got here, the Phoenix House was ready for me to come in. I had been through a few programs before and I had always failed to create a social support system for myself. Through this New Start program at Theo Lacey, I developed a core group of men that have to this day become my close friends and supporters. I do have that sense of security for myself. I always know I have a place to go. In my worst moment, I can come up here and just sit and hang out if I need to. What I do to help people that are still in the program is I like to come back to this place, the Phoenix House. I like to offer up support. I like to be a guiding light, someone who's gone ahead of where they're at now because people did that for me. And that's what gave me hope and encouragement and helped me along the road of sobriety. I think what keeps adults coming to Phoenix House is the modality of treatment that we have, which is peer driven. They get a lot of support from their peers and, and they begin to have a sense of family. And I think that that community feeling and having a function while they're in the house, a job while they're in the house, really does help them respond to the structure that we provide. And then they begin to understand that they deserve their lives to be different than being back incarcerated or out on the street. Or I think it's an individual thing, but I think that's very helpful. People should understand that the Phoenix House really has the power to change lives. And, um, I'd like to see it around for years to come. Keith, we've been talking about health care reform and how some of the programs that are going to help folks in recovery are going to be integrated into the whole health care uh, system. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I'd be glad to. This is a very exciting time um, uh, for uh, this field due to some real changes in public policy. The first one is, is parity. 
which is a law passed at the very end of the Bush administration and then the regulations were written during the Obama administration. And what parity rules say is that if you're an insurance company and you offer benefits for substance use uh, uh, disorder treatment, you can't make those benefits lesser than you could for any other condition. And that you used to be allowed to do that. You used to be able to say, you know, a, a outpatient copay is $10 unless it's for mental health or substance use, in which case it's $20. That's illegal now. So that, that should help uh, people who have private insurance be able to access care. Then in terms of the public insurance, the Affordable Care Act, or health care reform as people called it, also is really going to make quite an impact on this field. Medicaid's going to be expanded up to people who make 133% of poverty, which it historically hasn't covered. You're going to have health exchanges that people will compete to cover, uh, uh, offer insurance in. Both of those new programs are mandated that substance use care is an essential health care benefit. So it's a quite an achievement you know, for the field. That if you want to offer health insurance through health exchange, you have to co cover substance use treatment. If, you, if these new Medicaid dollars have to cover substance use treatment. And that was an achievement in part, I have to say, of the recovering community. A lot of recovering people uh, you know, help advocate for those changes um, around town and make that happen. And not just advocacy where they're you know, talking to politicians, but I think kitchen table advocacy where the people talk to each other and they understand this is an illness, it should be treated. And that made a constituency in the country because these, these changes were popular. Yeah. And both Bev and, and Joe, how do we make the new systems be recovery-oriented system of care? Uh, my first off-the-cuff response to you is that I think we need to make sure that recovering people are at the table and that they have an informed voice and that they are um, supported in sharing that voice. I think that's really important to um, make sure that people who are speaking for the recovery community um, really have ways to make sure that they're speaking not just for themselves but for a larger recovery community. I see. One of the, uh, I guess, exciting things about the health care reform is that recovery support services are, uh, is in there also. Um, and primary care, um, along with behavior health. In other words, that now that the recovery organizations, and of course you have health navigators and recovery coaches and peer specialists, are able to help a person in recovery, not only with mental health or substance use uh, addiction uh, problems, but also to link them to some primary care. Because we know that, that with recovery support, that I can't, you know, if I have cancer or diabetes or, or hurt in any kind of way, and especially that can also cause stress and, and cause me to relapse or go back to addiction and also seek uh, medications for any, as far as to drug related, and I don't need that. But healthcare reform has uh, a lot of this uh, recovery supports in it that also access uh, the community local on a local level. We're doing a lot of that right now, um, as from the primary care, the criminal justice, all of the providers are involved only because of the healthcare reform. They have initiated, and the same thing at the state level. Uh, so integration and also with primary care and behavioral health is important right now. Well, uh, Mr. Uh, the, the on the federal level, uh, in mental health, the uh, feds are experimenting. There are at least eight states that have been given grants, five-year grants, to transform their public health system, mental health system, into recovery-oriented. That is a huge thing, uh, to look at the whole public health system of mental health, and that's going to affect the substance abuse too. I'm so glad Thomasina brought that up because there's another point to this that's really, really key is that recovery is not just a service we're supposed to attach to treatment for three years while we have a grant and then it goes away. It's supposed to transform the entire treatment system. We have to change the way of doing business throughout it so it truly is a recovering support system. And uh, the, the systems that are thriving, like for example in, in Philadelphia, I'd, I'd say mm -hmm. where Bev is from as an example, or the work that Joe is doing, are the ones that are taking that on. This is a philosophical, cultural transformation, not just flavor of the month, a grant, we'll do this for a year and then we'll forget about yeah. it. And, and describe that for us, Well, uh, it really is a transformation process. And it's not only bringing people to the table, but really looking at all of the different aspects and components of the system. And that's why it's called recovery-oriented. That's why oriented. it's recovery-oriented. But what's really, for me, pretty exciting about it is the non-traditional community support services that have been out there for a long time. Such as? Uh, such as, um, 
um, some of the faith-based organizations, some of the um, recovery support services um, that are peer-to-peer -peer are now sort of all part of the mix. And so there's, there's a concerted effort to do linkages and to do warm handoffs for people. We're not just sending somebody there, but also to really walk with people on their recovery journey. Mm -hmm. And having um, support for doing that has been incredibly important. It's not just, you know, you go here and then you go here, you go here. There's a concerted effort to make sure that everybody is walking along the same path or the same, um, same kind of um, response to somebody. It, you know, we talk about no wrong door. And, you know, that, that if you land somewhere, you know, you're going to get an opportunity to be able to access services for recovery. So let's say I'm in recovery and I go to PROACT, mm -hmm. for example. Someone greets me. Do they do an assessment? Do they do uh, an orientation? What happens? Yeah, they, we say, how can we help you with your recovery? And for some people, it's kind of like, what? And it's, how can we help you with your recovery? And then we give them a tour and say, here are all the kinds of things that are available. Uh, which is transportation. Um, things like learning how to get an email address, because for many people who've been out mm -hmm. of circulation for a while, that's like a huge opportunity to get, you know, an opportunity to, we don't realize how important technology is now. Um, but, you know, how about do you need help with getting employment? You know, how about writing a resume? You know, all of those kinds of things. And um, then we say, you know, now we have a survey we'd like you to take, and what do you have to give us? You know, here, you know, what is it that you would like to get, but what would you like to offer, too? And most people will say, I've got nothing. And then we say, well, take a look at this. And they say, oh, well, gee, I do know how to cook, or I do know how to do this. Well, maybe you'd like to share that with somebody else. So we're trying to help people understand the value of giving back at the very earliest opportunity that they come into the process. And it's so exciting. Sometimes it's those giving back things are what in the long term keep people really committed to their recovery. Mm -hmm. um, it's a changing perspective. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, because that is a key element in the recovery oriented system of care, is strength base. Mm -hmm. uh, because not only does the community have so many resources and supports that they haven't tapped into, which that's when, when, when we pull together, then we can see that there's many strengths in the community. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes with the peer that comes into our place. We also let them know, because we do a strength base. We're not assessment, but a strength based model that where we talk to them and see well you mean that you have a high school diploma you mean you have a car or you have family even in town because some folks are homeless and and broke and busted and, and disgusted but but there but there are many that do have little things that, that can help them to maintain recovery and also guide them so that traveling companion which is another peer to help them with their strengths and also to give them more capital recovery capital there's four supports that we offer that most recovery organizations do and that's information support instrumental support which health and wellness gets into when talking about jobs employment and also uh, housing but also also social supports, okay, which is companion support, teaching them again how to socialize now, you know what I mean, in the community and how to navigate them in the community, jamming in recovery, recovery at the movies, right? And then the last one is emotional support, wow. they're helping them with their emotions and become emotionally mature in my recovery. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, many, of these, many of these places become communities. Mm -hmm. And people feel involved, they have, there's purpose in their life, they have meaning again, and, and they have friends. So it's, it's not just individual services, but it's a whole holistic um, support system that becomes, that becomes a community. And Keith, you know, we've just talked about a recovery-oriented system of care, but there's also the screening and brief intervention, mm -hmm. which really is at the front end as well. So mm -hmm. this is sort of the back end when folks get finished, you know, with their treatment or, or if they've done a spontaneous recovery through a mutual support network, et cetera. But um, when we come back, I'd like for you to start us off and talk about the screening and brief intervention and how relevant that is uh, with the new health reform. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov.
When you have a drug or alcohol problem, your whole world stops making sense. You can get help for yourself or a loved one and make sense of life again. For information, treatment referral, and most importantly, help. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When I lacked courage in myself, I was lent courage. When I didn't believe in myself, somebody believed in me. Uh, when I was hopeless, folks had hope for me. When you first get into recovery, you're looking back and you're thinking, you, all you can see is that wreckage. And what we are, we, we understand that wreckage, but we're that light, we're that hope. We've had that wreckage too. And this is where we're at today. I've been there. I've done this. I know what you're going through. I can help you if you will allow me to help you. The recovery mentor program. A group of staff that have been there done that. When you say you're gonna call me, finally you need to call me. Because a mentor can speak to somebody far differently than I can speak to somebody about motivating them for help and also seeing through all the filters. Is this an opportunity you really want? Comes with supportive housing, folks get people tied into the recovery community, they take them to 12-step meetings, they take them to other community support meetings and make sure they're making doctor appointments and they get their their food stamp cards so they can get on their feet, pots and pans, all of that. It's a tremendous program and it has a huge success rate. In the past I'd walk out of detox and I'd take those first breaths of air after a week or 10 days or two weeks and immediately just not knowing what to do next. I was given some really basic things, um, you know, a beds, shelter, um, a community, a recovery community that goes from um, people that are in my same position to um, to the mentors, to janitors on the floor that went through the program in recovery. I've got this rockin' little SRO, this little eight by 10 room, and uh, I get to be safe for a minute. You shelter, you have food, you have safety, like I can focus on other things now. He gave me a very simple task, task to do. Um, go to a meeting, check with them in the morning. It's like, okay, I can, that's manageable, I can do that. You have to, first you have to do do meetings. It's a man, it's a must. Make all your appointment groups, acupuncture, and check in with your mentor every day. And you get held accountable for your actions. We can help folks transition safely, and when I say safely, with some prognosis that they're going to be successful. Now I'm engaged in an employment access portion of this program and person I'm talking to is is a recovering addict herself so it's like that feeling of needing to explain um, you know explain why I have gaps in my you know my employment history is is I don't need to explain that it showed me that I can be a better man that I don't have to use to handle my problems or face everyday life my belief system has changed like, I don't believe I'm a victim. I believe I have choices. I can let go of resentments. And um, it's like an emotional and spiritual freedom that I've never experienced in my whole life. I can actually do some, some good and actually affect people positively in this world. And that's a responsibility that, that, um, that I feel and that I'm excited to, to live up to. And Keith, let's talk a little bit about screening and brief interventions, which are really at the front end of what the, our last panel conversation. Talk, talk to us. I know that SAMHSA uh, was one of the proponents of screening and brief interventions, and then ONDCP uh, began to really uh, promote it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so uh, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, or, or ESPERT as it goes by its acronym, um, it started as a, a very strange idea. No one thought it, you know, that you could possibly reach uh, the addicted population in the primary care setting or in the emergency room. But it turns out uh, from a lot of research that in fact you can. These are great opportunities that are often missed. So the idea behind ESPERT is to take advantage of those opportunities and, and hopefully st you know, stop people from having to go so far into you know, a, a really terrible addiction career before they get help. 
So this might be, you know, your primary care doctor, uh, when they ask you all the questions about do you exercise, asking also, can you tell me something about your drinking? Or have you ever used a prescription medicine in a non-prescription way? And, and that gives a chance for somebody, an authority figure in a white coat to say, hey, you know, that's unhealthy. Uh, and if it's at a low level, maybe I can handle it here in primary care. But if this is really serious, I need to uh, talk to you about some of the options out there because there are treatments that work. You could, you could overcome this problem, and I'd really like to see that happen. So that's, and that's almost a preventive measure, really. Right, right. It's quite, it, it, in, sort of a, in, in public health, they talk about primary prevention, where you stop a condition entirely. So experts, secondary prevention. So the person has the problem, but you try to catch it as early as you can. And that, that, that it's, all the evidence is that it's so much easier you know, to, to change when you haven't you know, blown out your marriage and your job and your housing and all that kind of thing. So catch people early. And, and, and at policy weight, SAMHSA has been uh, very uh, uh, proactive in uh, providing grants to states to do ESPERT. A lot of private insurers are now covering it because of work uh, through a number of administrations to put it into health insurance and a billing code. You, you know, in, in healthcare, you don't exist until you have a billing code. <laughs> so so um, it, it's, I think, one of the more exciting things that's happening in healthcare at the moment. Which really brings up a challenge talking about billing codes in terms of recovery services. Um, have they achieved the, in some states I believe that they do have a billing code, correct Joe? Right, and we're just fortunate um, that these are those great times that uh, the managed care has jumped on board and we are, we are fortunate to have uh, two billing codes uh, to do peer services, as a matter of fact, to do peer recovery coaching and to do peer support groups. The other thing, to how it connects to the, uh, to the SBIRT, is that that SBIRT is the screening piece. And right now, we are actually in training to see how can we do that early intervention and screening in the emergency rooms in the hospital for folks that's coming in with drug and alcohol addiction related uh, incidences. So, it's very important. Piggyback on what Joe was saying, our experience with SPERT has been not only to um, encourage and train physicians and um, physicians assistants and all to do that, but then also to provide the support so that if somebody does screen that they've got, that they're at higher risk, to be able to make it easy for them to access services. And so our recovery coaches are able to, you know, connect right with the person at that point. Mm -hmm. They may need just some education, but then, and so we have packets of information for them and um, you know things like that but also to make to make actual um, transition into some level of care if they need to because right then they're motivated mm -hmm. and they're you know they're willing to do it so mm -hmm. it is a great um, you know kind of um, much much more consistent process than just you know here go do something um, and so that's been very successful mm -hmm. and we spoke about uh, Thomasina said that it's a peer-to-peer -peer. you've talked about recovery coaches where there's uh, a little bit of training to let people know what are the primary elements that they must know about mm -hmm. in order to help someone else. In the context of family, however, what are some of the issues that family need to be aware of in order to support someone in recovery? And I'll start with you, Bev. Um, they need to understand the illness they're dealing with. So um, we have a ongoing education program for families that deals with what is the illness and understanding addiction. Um, then, you know, what's my role? You know, what are the kinds of things that are helpful and constructive and what are the things that aren't so helpful and constructive? And then what are the resources out there and how can I access them? Um, some of the others is just, you know, a family understanding their rights and that um, some of the confidentiality laws don't apply to the family. You know, I can tell you what, you know, what is happening in my family's life. Um, the counselor or the treatment provider may not be able to tell me what's happening, but as a family member, I can do that and really help, really support in a very constructive way the person's recovery. And why is it important, Joe, for families to get engaged? Well, one is, of course, uh, like Bev said today, we're dealing with a disease, one, that it really hurts the whole family, it affects the whole family. One of the things that we say is that risk factors are not predictive factors with protective factors. And the one thing is that we do protect the community with recovery support services. We, and there's many, of course, paths to a family, not only Al-Anon and Narcanon, but also, of course, that culturally, when you talk about Latinos or African Americans, you know, African Americans, they'll go to the church mm -hmm. first. You know, and they'll see the pastor before they'll see a professional. 
of course, mm -hmm. and they'll take the whole family, and the pastor is not skilled in, of course, in addiction and disease. So it's very important that families also get all of the resources in the community and know about not only addiction but also mental health. Um, and how do I uh, tap into those resources? Well, we are training. Um, NACOA is going around the country training. It's called a non-denominational training program. We have some clergy guidelines as to what clergy can do. So there are resources, at least we're beginning to, you know, uh, to, to mm -hmm. pay a little closer attention to the role of faith, and everyone has uh, faith initiatives mm -hmm. that they're working on as well. But I want to get back to uh, the whole experience of, of relapsing. In spite of all of this, there will be some individuals, uh, right, Keith, that will relapse. Absolutely. And, and um, what should the family do and what should the individual do in the event that there is a relapse? I'm so glad you brought that up because I think the one element about recovery-oriented uh, systems of care we probably haven't talked about, it's the recognition that these problems are chronic and not acute. So a lot of times the way we set up treatment uh, in the United States, we treat it like a broken bone or something. You go to the hospital, I set your bone, then you're done and you're, and you're going you're gonna to heal naturally. But the truth is that most people will relapse. Most, you know, take a very common experience, quitting smoking. Most people who have succeeded quitting smoking failed six or seven times. Those are people who succeeded. You see that in alcohol. You see that with the other drugs. So what that means is that you should not feel dispirited, shamed that you had a relapse. It's a very, it's highly likely you'll have a relapse. That's the nature of the condition. And by the way, people who have heart problems have relapses. People who have back pain have relapses. That's, that's why, you know, that's what chronic mental disorders are like. They wax and they wane depending how life is going. So for the family not to get dispirited and not to feel, um, you know, hostile that the person has done this, but just try to accept that, you know, this is a chronic illness. And it doesn't mean, by the way, you can't get mad. I mean, it's natural if, uh, you know, if, if your spouse is addicted and treats you badly or you know, treats your kids badly, of course you're going to get mad. It's not to, not to take away those feelings, but just to give you a way to understand this is what is going on. Um, this is what millions of people have gone through. They've had relapses. And many of those people go on and recover. So it's not, it's, it's tough, but it's not the end of the world. In terms of the family, let's, let's be honest, the family suffers too. It's not just the person in recovery. Many family members, with all family members with the children, et cetera, suffer a great deal. And I think the recovery supports need to include the family. And I know like the 12-step Al-Anon and Naranon are for family members. And there for were, the children, the and the Alateen. Chil right, Alateen for the, for the children. And there was a, uh, in, during the 80s in California, during the social model movement, alcohol recovery movement back in the, in, uh, the 1980s, there was a, uh, a wise man in the same county that Leon Panetta is that argued that if, if the whole country adopted Al-Anon principles, we would we'd all be a lot better off in terms of actually helping people in recovery, that there are very constructive ways of helping, uh, not capitulating, Mm -hmm. but standing firm and, and uh, helping. So I, th I think the family needs to be seen as a group that suffers and needs their own recovery in and of themselves. I, I think that's accurate, but I think also um, sometimes they retreat, you know, and, and all of the shame comes back in and they've done something wrong. And I think that's where it's so important to understand the nature of this illness, right. but also not to hide it. You know, that, that, re, that a relapse can be a learning, very constructive experience for people to look at, you know, what, what they've maybe done that wasn't helpful. And both the individual and the family can look at how they can get back on track. And I've had many people who've said, you know, gee, I really learned and it really um, expanded my recovery, you know, by going through that relapse. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean, though, that it's necessary. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the family, uh, you know, they, sometimes they just don't know how to let go. Right. And let the and, and it's time for treatment for my family member. I mean, and you get a lot. We get a lot of family members that are very angry because they're tired of relapsing mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And I've been taking right. care of this person, yeah. and so now it's time for me to let a professional help. Yeah. And then the person will come back to the family because yes. I mean we know that culturally that even Latinos, you know, what I mean, 
they love their family. They're not going to let go of that family, right. man. They're going to go through the whole process with the family. Right. But, it, but it's very important that they learn how to let go. And Bev, getting back to all of this, I mean, all of the, what we said is, is actually very on target in terms of helping individuals in recovery in the various programs. But you were speaking at one point about the broader community and, and the Recovery Month event that was held in, in Pennsylvania. And what is significant about that and why should other communities adopt that type of, of effort? Uh -huh. One, it's a, it's a validation that recovery is possible. And so I think it um, really reframes for people what the possibility of recovery. I think it is an incredible opportunity for families to really celebrate recovery together and to validate the opportunity that, um, you know, they as a group have really um, been made progress um, and can support in a very tangible way recovery, just like you do with other diseases. And I think that it's so important for people to feel normal that here they are, you know, being part of something that is similar to what other diseases experience. I mean, there are other marches and walks and mm -hmm. kinds of things, and now their disease has that too. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. It's a very emotional experience for many people to get that kind of recognition. This year, for the first time, we had people lining the streets cheering the walkers. Mm -hmm. And that was like a significant change from our first walk had 100 people in it. You know, this was 11,000 people, and we frankly walked to ourselves. And now having people on the curbs going down a main street in Philadelphia, proud of their recovery, just as a huge reframe. And, and SAMHSA should be- And public policy individuals, absolutely. you know, uh, elected officials, civic, walking, civic leaders, know that there yeah. is a movement, there is yeah. a force. And it's really important that they're there. Um, you know, that public policy officials, people from SAMHSA, people from the governor's office, um, you know, are there kind of recognizing the, um, the progress that people have made. Very, very important. And I want to remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month, and every individual in recovery, their families, their friends, and all the individuals in the community can get together, host events and activities to help celebrate those in recovery. Thank you for being here. It was a great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month Kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. <laughs>